Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. This is the first time POFIM is reaching out to a um, um, wider audience within the Asia Pacific region, and we are very excited. I'll start off with a brief in, um, overview of COFIM, and then I'll pass the mic on to my, the presenter. Uh, COFIM is an advocacy collective of uh, activist academics and practitioners who, from across the globe, who've been working to assert, reassert a feminist perspective in violence against women and girls, and uh, which is also referred to as GBV. COFIM was born out of a concern, a growing concern among the community of uh, uh, activists working on GBV and gender inequality about the growing backlash against uh, asserting a feminist perspective in efforts to address GBV. And so a bunch of uh, practitioners and activists and academics came together and COFIM was officially launched in 2018. And for us, what is a feminist perspective is a very is very important because we believe that um, um, addressing GBV and violence against women means addressing uh, means working from a th theory of violence that recognizes the role of violence in maintaining oppressive and inequitable gender hierarchies and recognizing that gender oppression is um, situated in systems and structures and it's systemic and we in order to address and address GBV and bring about transformative change, we need to address these um, systemic practices. And lastly, we believe that uh, we believe in applying an intersectional approach and we believe that work functions, uh, violence against women and girls functions across multiple dimensions of oppression and in many ways. And so um, how have we been uh, integrating that into our work. We are working with the activists across the globe, a lot of whom are our members. We are working with them to reclaim space for women-centered, women-led, and women's rights-driven work on uh, violence against women in humanitarian and development settings. And we believe, and we are working to advocate for um, engagement of men and boys in efforts to address violence against women. So in a way that the accountability to women and girls is prioritized and men are better allies by being more accountable to women and girls in efforts to address violence against women. And we, very importantly, we also, we do not, we believe that to work, any work done to address GBV should not create or perpetuate victimhood competition. So with that, I would, um, I, um, our presenters today will be building on this feminist approach, so I won't go into further detail. Um, I would just like to say that we have, um, uh, you know, if anybody wants to get more information on COFAM, we're going to have a slide at the end. And you know, you can also message us here and we would, uh, I'm going to pass the mics shortly to the presenters, but uh, as you listen to them, please do drop in your questions in the chat box and we'll have about 40, 45 minutes of questions and answer sessions at the end. And uh, you know, we're looking forward to hearing more uh, and you know, addressing your questions. So with that, uh, um, our presenters today are Shamima Ali from the v Fiji Women's Crisis Center, Asunda Maron from the um, Strengthening Hospital Responses to Family Violence Program in West Melbourne, Australia, and he, Louis, who's are at the RMIT University, a PhD candidate there in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, so with that, I'd like to pass the, pass the mic on to Shamima. Uh, if you could please introduce yourself. Yes. Um, Good afternoon, Anissa Ambulavinaka from Fiji. I'm Shamima Ali, and I work for the Fiji Women's Crisis Center and have worked in this space for over 35 years in Fiji and the Pacific. Um, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Asunta Moroni, and um, I work in Melbourne, Victoria for Western Health, which is an acute health service. I've worked in the women's sector for over 20 years with refugee women, women in prison, young women. Um, and I'm currently working um, with the family violence program at the hospital. And when my presentation starts, I'm sorry if my dog barks. 
<laughs> Hi, um, my name is Yiman Louis, first time lucky. <laughs> I'm from uh, Melbourne um, in Victoria and I'm a PhD student at RMIT University. I have been a survival advocate for over 30 years and um, yeah, and my PhD is around um, domestic violence. So we'll talk about it more later, yes. <laughs> uh, with that, we'd like to ask Shamima to please uh, tell us more about her work. Thank you, Fatima. So I'll start off with giving an overview of some statistics, and then I'll talk about Fiji and the crisis center and the work that is done here, and then an overview of the Pacific. So the Pacific, as many other countries around the world, has some of the highest rates of violence against women in the world. Research on intimate partner violence using the WHO model um, methodology reveals that countries like Kiribati in the Pacific have rates as high as 68%, Fiji 66%, Solomon Island 64%, Vanuatu 60%, Samoa 46%, Tonga 40%, Republic of Marshall Islands 51%. So these are very high rates and these uh, surveys were done very recently, but work on ending violence against women and girls has been ongoing in the Pacific for over 35 years now. So having said that, I'd just like to talk about a little bit about the Fiji Women's Crisis Center, which has pioneered the work uh, on ending violence against women uh, in Fiji and the Pacific. It was established in 1984 as a counseling service for survivors of violence. We later had to include children because the children started coming in mm -hmm. and we realized there, was, there were high rate, uh, rates of child sexual abuse and rape also in this country. Uh, the organization has always based on, uh, it has always been based on human rights, democracy, and the rule of law, and has always used a feminist uh, perspective to do the work. Uh, um, we, uh, all our work on response and prevention is rights-based and based on women's experiences of violence, discrimination, inequality, and so on. And you know, in the early 90s, the chant, women's rights are human rights, became the slogan, both with us and out in the Pacific. Now we offer counseling, which is still the core business that determines what we do. Uh, we have huge community outreach, you know, an island like Fiji has, uh, a country like Fiji has about 350 islands and most of them inhabited. And so, you know, that community outreach goes everywhere. Uh, we are very big on advocacy and lobbying. Many, many changes have come about over 36 years of advocacy and lobbying in a very tough terrain, I must tell you. Uh, we have a training and research institute that we have established on gender violence against women and human rights, uh, a male advocacy for women's human rights program, uh, a legal uh, uh, department ensuring access to justice for women and girls and children, and we have a, a, a shelters program just starting on a shelters program. And of course, the Pacific Regional Program with the Pacific Women's Network Against Violence Against Women, uh, which was established in 1992 after the first regional, first ever regional meeting on ending violence against women and girls. Now 15 can, countries are in the membership with about 101 organizations, mostly women's NGOs and some government entities like from the police, legal and health sectors. Through the network, we provide uh, training on gender, women, uh, women's human rights and violence against women, very strong feminist human rights based approaches. The institute, the training institute is called FLARE, F-L-A-R-E, Feminist Learning for Advocacy, Research and Empowerment. And here we are targeting different sectors, mostly women, but also practitioners, policy makers, the health sector, and as I said, police. We have a huge training both nationally for with police officers as well as regional policing with the Australian Federal Police in partnership with them. Of course, that's all pre-COVID. Uh, we will. We are still, you know, exploring how we move forward with online uh, offering this online training. I wanted to talk a little bit about male advocacy for women's human rights. And, and this program we started in 2001. And uh, it's not only about, it's founded on feminist pr principles and human rights. It's not only changing the uh, behavior of men on uh, 
their own behavior, but it also works for a broader social change. Accountability to the feminist women's movement is essential uh, and uh, targeting today, and this program targets traditional and religious leaders, you know, tradition, culture, religion, very important in the Pacific, uh, and traditional leadership, very important. Police, youth leaders, the military, policy makers, and legislators. You know, to work with men, we have to have a very strong monitoring process, and it can be very, very tough. It's, you know, a work in progress, and we're all learning. We've got some very good male advocates. This program has been rolled out into the Pacific, in Fiji, in Tonga, in Vanuatu, Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, Cook Islands, and so on, and amongst the police force around the, around the region. But still, work in progress, I would say. Not a, not a very easy place to work in. The Fiji Women's Crisis Center model has been adopted by most network members around the Pacific with adaptations, but keeping to human rights principles as much as possible. It can become very hard. As we, can, uh, you know, as we would all know, people want to end rape, they've got, uh, and uh, they've got very good intentions, ending rape, domestic violence, child rape, sexual harassment, and so on, but very, very uncomfortable around promoting gender equality and equity, women's human rights, and feminism. And uh, also, there's a huge aversion to addressing patriarchy, male power and control, and privileges as the cause of, as the main cause of violence against women. So, and we also have to work in the cultural and traditional context without losing the feminist perspective, the rights-based perspective. We have persevered, and now, of course, 36 years later, Violence against women has landed on everyone's agenda. It's become on everyone's agenda, including the donors, from a place of not wanting to fund it in 1984, uh, saying that it was a women's issue and uh, not a development issue or a human rights issue. Of course, now there's a lot of funding available, lots of donors available, and lots of knowledge available worldwide and, of course, in the Pacific. Um, in Fiji, also, we have this is where governments and uh, you know, NGOs come together, an EVO task force, which was established over 10 years ago. And it's led by the Ministry for Women. And uh, we, the Crisis Center, as the leading uh, organization in this work, plays a very important role in keeping the women's rights perspective right there and not losing sight of that. Um, the entry point, of course, is using human rights. It can be difficult also because uh, uh, you know, human rights also is seen as a foreign concept. Uh, so, you know, how we do it within the context of the Pacific of Fiji is very, very important. As a result, uh, you know, some of the things that have happened well, and of course, this is very ably supported by, uh, you know, s uh, some of the agencies like the you know, like UN Women, which is very much part of the Evo Task Force. Out of that, we have a um, we have developed. And, uh, is, and is, it is now in use is the service delivery protocol on GBV. And it's very much based on feminist principles, women-centered human rights and women's access to justice. So I think this is the first document in Fiji where you have all of this and it is about providing services for survivors of uh, uh, gender-based violence. The second thing that we have done in Fiji is the National Action Plan for uh, Prevention of GBV, and that is a work in progress right now, and it actually names patriarchy as the root cause of violence against women. Mm -hmm. And the word is also mentioned in Parliament now nowadays. So, you know, we've come a long way, uh, you know, uh, and uh, so on, but it's really very, very difficult when we talk about dismantling uh, uh, patriarchy. But the fact that it is being said, those words are being uttered, I think that is progress for us and we have to celebrate those little little gains. Of course, when we want to talk about, we want to introduce feminist perspectives into our work, it's always hard work and a constant struggle. You can't sort of 
lie back on your laurels and enjoy the moment because something comes up or other. In Fiji, we have had three coups, two of them military, one civilian coup. So that often puts back feminism, mm -hmm. women's rights, human rights on the back burner. And within that, you have women's human rights. Um, so, you know, and then now with COVID, things do, you make some gains and then you have to go back. But the women's movement, the feminist women's movement, ensures that we ensure that we are never caught off balance, that whenever disasters, and then we have disasters like cyclones, often that puts us back also, and we are always prepared for disasters. We recognize the causes and we are back on our feet, very quickly pushing back on any um, uh, you know, degradation of uh, uh, women's human rights. Um, now with the Fiji Women's Crisis Center, we use the word feminist and feminism quite regularly in all our do documents and reports and so on to our donors in our uh, design documents. And uh, you know, it's passing by, people are not saying anything. We, we, we needed to say women's human rights before, which is of course uh, feminism mainstreamed. But now we are getting a bit bolder and people I think are getting used to it um, around here in, in our area and particularly in Fiji. So, you know, it's, we're able to use that uh, more feminist, as more feminist organizations are emerging, people are talking about feminism and social media also has changed the dialogue around uh, patriarchy, around feminism and so on. And we see a lot of young people getting on and talking about rape, against rape. Of course, you have all the other ones, the bad ones. I mean, the all the bad dialogue, the really harmful dialogue that goes around, but this emerging um, issue of young people getting involved in activism online and so on also goes a long way and has gone a long way here to, you know, uh, really for people to accept some of the languages and also some of the perspectives, particularly women's rights perspectives. Obstacles also arise from INGOs, development partners, who in, while we have a very strong traditional patriarchal system here, uh, we, which often pose obstacles. We've done a lot of work. I think we're on the right path, still a struggle, but the new people on the scene, there's a lot of funding around. So we've got INGOs, development partners, who intending to please governments, again, lose some of the feminist perspective and are willing to let it become a welfare or a health issue only. That is the easier thing to deal with. And uh, and rather than you know feminism, women's human rights, and so on, there are huge risks to the to the work that is being done. Lots of funding and programs funded, without due diligence, without alignment to national uh, and or global uh, best practice or regional best practice on women's human rights. So these things we are dealing with, we bring up to the core. What we have learned is that keep at it, enter every forum and raise feminist perspectives wherever we can. Not never losing sight of that. We don't necessarily have to say the F word, but ensure the inclusion of the perspective in this work. Personally, I'm very comfortable to use the word all the time and I've been around for so long, people are getting used to me uh, calling myself that and using the word feminist and feminism. And you know, I get very happy when some people call me a feminist, people who wouldn't normally call me a feminist. So you know, that's the change that we are seeing. But sometimes, you know, we don't have to shoot the messenger, and we have to, uh, you know, without losing sight. I believe without losing sight of the perspective, the feminist perspective, the women's human rights perspective, and uh, you know, and really um, uh, uh, founding our work on that. Uh, we can do without using that word too and use other words, but never losing sight of, of, the, of patriarchy and of feminist principles. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shamima. That was um, very interesting. And you're right, uh, feminism is still such a, in many parts of the world, it's still such a almost dirty word, you know, and we get so much backlash on that. Uh, with that, Santa, we'd have a hand over the mic to you. Thank you. Um, so thank you, everyone. So um, yes, my name is Asunta. I'd like to begin by firstly acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people 
of the Greater Kulin Nation. Um, I would like to acknowledge that this is stolen land and that sovereignty was never ceded and that the loss of land, language and culture has contributed to the disproportionate representation of Aboriginal women in custody, lower life expectancy and the deaths of Aboriginal women and children by both Aboriginal men and non-Aboriginal men because of family and domestic violence. Um, so I'm speaking to you from um, Melbourne in Victoria and I thought it was just important to put that context in for our First Nations people and acknowledge them. So um, as I said, I work at Western Health and Western Health, for those of you who don't know, is an acute health service. So we're a mainstream hospital. Um, that's us there. That's one of our sites. We've got five acute sites um, that provide a range of services from emergency care to, um, you know, our patients. Um, and so we we don't, in this context, see ourselves as a specialist family violence feminist organisation. We are a health service. And there in, in there lies the challenge for a feminist like me working in a mainstream service because, um, you know, we're always fighting an uphill battle to, to sort of champion the cause of gender-based violence and feminism. Um, so for, um, as I said, I'm in Melbourne, Victoria, and that just to give you some context that, um, you know, we're at sort of a, we have six sort of states and one territory, and each um, state is governed by a state government. And so what I'm going to be talking about is really just the strategy of the Victorian government. So the, the, what I'm talking about only applies to Victoria, not the whole of Australia. So this is um, a state government issue because hospitals and health services are run by the state. So um, the next slide, I think, is Melbourne, Victoria, just to show you a little bit about our, of our wonderful city um, that is unfortunately in lockdown at the moment. We're in stage four lockdown. Um, but, um, you know, there's five million people in Victoria, seven million, uh, five million in Melbourne, sorry, seven million in Victoria. And our top 10 countries of birth are Australia, England, India, China, New Zealand and Italy. Um, so a, quite a, a multicultural sort of um, mix. Um, I just want to also begin by saying that we don't have all the answers <laughs> and certainly, um, you know, we're, we're not doing everything right, but it's a start. So I guess just to let you know that Victoria at this stage is in what the government calls a reform agenda for uh, women's uh, violence against women. So Victoria has a 10 year plan to end violence against women, which is, which is fantastic really. Um, and some of the, um, not uh, some of the key features of that plan, I won't go through all of them, but some of them are that no woman or child is killed as a result of family violence. A big ask, because we know the stats, one woman a week is killed because of um, uh, domestic violence by a current or former partner. And I think that's the same around the world. And it could even be more because, you know, we don't get reports. Um, that all Victorians will believe that family violence and gender inequality is unacceptable and will hold attitudes that support respectful relationships. So the government has recognised that family violence is gender based and it's rooted in gender inequality. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's quite a big achievement for a government to, to outwardly say that. Um, and that the other, the other key strategies that victims and survivors will be supported to remain safely in their homes, that women and children at risk of family violence will be able to effectively um, engage with services and at an early intervention point, and that workers in universal services, so non-family violence services like, um, like hospitals, will feel confident in identifying and responding to all, all forms of family violence. So I guess really the government um, is clear that this is a whole of sector approach, that it can't just be the family violence sector that responds. So um, in, in making all services, so, you know, basically all health services, mainstream community services, um, you know, all the health and human services responsible, that, you know, it is a, it is a joint effort. The links there that I've put up um, are just some links to some of the strategies, some of the, the toolkit, the strategies um, and inquiry, which I talk about and the plan. And of course, my email, if you want to ask me any questions later. But I wanted to go back and to 2014, because there was a, a real key incident in Victoria that triggered this government tenure of reform agenda. So in 2014, a man called Greg Anderson murdered his son, Luke Batty, who was then 11, in front of witnesses at a children's cricket match. Um, he was later 
um, shot by police and died. But this inquiry, this, this incident really rocked the nation or rocked Victoria in particular. Um, and, you know, I want to acknowledge also that um, a lot of women had died before this. And of course, a lot of Indigenous women have died. But this incident really somehow triggered something in, in, in the government and in the community. And um, there was a coronial investigation, of course, and the coroner found that there were systems and structures that failed both Luke and his mother, Rosie. And what the coroner found, and you can read the coroner's report there if you're interested, but what the coroner found that there was essentially no centralised risk, risk assessment tool that accurately predicted um, the events that were going to happen, um, that um, his death was preceded by years of family violence perpetrated against, um, against him and his mother, and that Luke was exposed to emotional psychological harm during this time, and nobody picked was able to sort of pick that up. That gaps in the family violence system meant that Greg Anderson was never held to account for his violence, and that delays in um, intervention orders, warrants, assessments, um, that people missed warning signs. Um, and, you know, there's a whole lot of key invest other findings, but those are some of the key findings. So the, this, this incident triggered a Royal Commission into family violence in Victoria. And for those of you who don't know, a Royal Commission is like, you know, a government investigation that, um, that um, makes some recommendation to government. It's independent to government. And the Royal Commission, um, which is also there, you can read the report. It's like about 5,000 pages, but anyway, um, uh, made 227 recommendations to government and government responded and said that they would accept all 227 recommendations. And some of the key recommendations were that services need to, needed to reflect the needs of women and children. Um, so you, there's a recognition that, um, that, you know, women's and children's views were not um, at the forefront of services and that services need to respond better and particularly mainstream services, not so much specialist services, but mainstream services, um, that there needed to be a sustained focus on supporting women and children and that, um, you know, police, courts, child protection um, needed to respond um, in a way that protected women and children more and that really protected that um, Protect, protected the bond between a mother and, and the children if the mother was not the perpetrator. So what did this look like in practice? So really what the government has now put into, a, into place is a coordinated risk management framework, which we call the multi-agency risk assessment and management framework. It's a very long word, but anyway, it's a framework that um, can, in, in a way under legislation um, makes sure makes, or that family violence services, courts, police, education, hospitals, mental health, community services, all those services work under this framework. And that framework um, sets out clear responsibilities at every level. Um, um, also, at every level um, about how they should respond. Have I got one minute left? Have I been talking for 10 minutes? No. Um, anyway, um, so I guess under the framework, um, you know, we're compelled to, uh, at the hospital, are compelled to identify family violence, screen and, um, and respond and refer to specialist services. So, you know, the government set up all sorts of things like um, um, family violence uh, hubs, so safety hubs for women so that they could go to, um, they've given police greater powers to remove perpetrators from um, the home so the woman doesn't have to put in an intervention order herself, it can be taken out of her hands and police can support her with that. Um, and, you know, there's criticisms and responses to all that about whether it's a, it's a good move or not to empower, um, whether it takes away women's um, empowerment. But, you know, all these things are weighed up and um, and, and um, in, the, in that situation and uh, assessed. So, um, so, oh yeah, so, um, so also really my role was to make sure that our staff were able to, so the government funded every health service with a project officer like myself. Um, and really our role is to train our doctors and nurses to identify and other clinicians to identify the signs of family violence when a woman presents and to respond and refer them to specialist services. 
Um, this in itself has had challenges because, um, yes, you're right, we, we are fighting patriarchy, um, but uh, in a hospital, we're also fighting a biomedical system that only thinks about, um, uh, that only thinks about, you know, the sort of the, the medical issue. So when a woman presents to our emergency services, they, um, they may present to our triage system and present with a black eye. And so that's what's treated. And so what was happening was that, you know, the, our clinicians weren't inquiring further. And so this forces our clinicians now to make sure that they are inquiring about what's brought that, this woman here, what's led her to this position. And, you know, is there any other issues that we need to deal with and referring them on to specialist service? So, um, you know, we are fighting those biomedical systems. Um, but, you know, it's been a journey and four year, we're about five years on. It is a 10-year plan. Um, we're about five years on. Um, and I can say that things are slowly changing. Um, what we are expecting that this will take 10 years for cultural shift, if not even more. But the issue is that I don't think we've got 10 years to wait. I think that this is this now, even with COVID, it's become... Um, you know, things, uh, violence has escalated. We've seen a 40% increase um, in um, family violence ser services, um, you know, and it, it's really come to, you know, we're, we're trying to get a situation where there's advocates who are pushing for coercive control to be a criminal offence in itself. Um, so, you know, we're, we're seeing, um, you know, this, this really ramp up in, in how it's playing out, um, but it's going to take a long time. But all we can do is keep going. Um, in the early, early time, early beginning of this project, we did face a lot of backlash from the family violence sector, who thought that mainstream services were entering into their territory. Um, but that has calmed down, and so now the specialist um, sector is um, working. Yeah, I'm almost almost finished. The, the specialist sector is um, working with us, um, and they realise that we're in that early intervention, um, you know, that sort of primary identification space, um, and that specialist services have their own, own role. Um, and I, just to just to finish off, I guess really what we saw in the beginning was that also we saw women's um, really pleased with this response by government, but also we saw women ringing up specialist services and saying, can you please make them stop those ads on television? Because every time he sees those ads, he gets even more and more angry. So we saw a backlash for men and a backlash for men's groups. And of course, that's because once you take away someone's power and privilege that they've always had, that, you know, the perpetrator we know will escalate control. So, um, you know, it, we've got a long way to go, but um, it's a start and it's, I'm grateful that I'm working under a system that allows me to um, continue this work. Thank you. Thank you, Santa. That was, uh, we have a couple of questions for you, uh, but we'll, we'll keep them uh, for the end and I'll pass, uh, pass the mic over to E. Hi, everybody. Um, um, thank you so much. It was so um, inspirational to hear the other two speakers, the actual practice of work of um, people doing um, to um, try to end uh, violence against women. So um, my name is Yiman Louis. So I'm from um, Melbourne doing a PhD. Um, so it's a very different favor than um, the previous two workers. So I'm, um, my topic is um, technology safety and domestic violence, the wisdom of lived experience among ethnic Chinese women in Australia. Um, the reason that I'm focusing on this because um, how it came about is I was, um, as I said, I've been a survivor advocate. So every now and then I'll go to um, do a, give a talk to talk about my own lived experience. And it was at one of those occasions that I came across um, the CEO of the organization talk about their clients, what issues they face. And one of them was called technology facilitated abuse. And I was sitting there and thinking, what is that? Like, 
I know that domestic violence in the Australian um, set, setting is include, you know, psychological, emotional, um, spiritual, um, you know, sexual, financial, but I never come across abuse facilitated by technology. So I was quite intrigued by this. So I went back and then I did a bit of like looking up and I realized that um, with the advance of technology, that um, perpetrators are getting very, very clever and they are using um, technology. When I say technology, that would mean, you know, could be a smartphone, could be any other digital device to do their dirty work. Um, so, um, so these are my supervisors. So they are the people behind me to sort of like, yeah. So that's how I come about then. Um, I just chance have it, then I got an um, opportunity to do the research. So I say, okay, let me do the research that look into um, how technology have um, sort of like play a role in the facilitation of abuse, as well as um, also I'm also interested in whether that can um, help women or hinder women if they have been going through domestic violence themselves, especially if they have experienced some sort of abuse that are being perpetrated by technology. Okay, so um, what I'm going, I will hope that by the end of the talk that um, I'll give you some idea um, of what my research is about and, and the methods that I'm using to answer my research question. And I'm sorry that it's not gonna be as exciting as I with the previous two workers, so bear with me. And, um, and then um, that as, as I believe there will be some question at the end, so um, feel free. Um, so um, thank you for us to um, introduce like the um, setting of Melbourne and Victoria. So that's where I also come from. Um, in these slides, like you can see, I got some uh, figures in there. As um, Asuta um, mentioned, so in Australia, average um, one one woman will die because of domestic violence um, each week, and one in six women experience um, domestic violence by an intimate partner. And if we include um, boyfriends and also like intimate partners that is not living together and that rate will increase to one in four Australian women. Um, while the men's preference is around one in 20 and um, so it is pretty much like uh, what the people were um, so in the sense is it's, um, gender inequality and uh, patriarchal and it is a pretty much a gender-based violence um, in Australia as well and so I'm not sure how many of you have heard about um, technology facilitated abuse which I will do an acronym TFA because it's quite a mouthful for me <laughs> my English is not my first language so within the context of DV TFA means using um, internet enabled devices like smartphones computers tablets wearables, um, you know, to, for the perpetrator to uh, coerce, intimidate, stalk, uh, or harass um, their intimate partner. Um, give you examples. So uh, when I first started to look into this topic, I came across like, um, even like in the news, like reporting or workers reporting, that perpetrator could install like a spyware, or they could use like existing apps that we have. We all have like Google Map, find um, my friend, you know, the iPhone, and they will do the GPS tracking of their partners. So um, in a sense, or like, you know, sending multiple messages, keep calling abusive and all this sort of thing. So uh, the reason they, the forming areas of TFA is harassment, stalking, monitoring, impersonations that could be like go on your Facebook, you know, pretending it's you and then um, say horrible things to other people to try to isolate you. And also the last area is threats and punishment. So it could be like, if you're not doing certain thing, I'll take away your mobile or, you know, sending threats, so on and so forth. Um, couple of the, how it all started here, I think a couple of the landmark research here is by um, Woodlock and her research revealed that the abuse through, um, m mostly of them is through text messages, 
uh, Facebook tracking and uh, monitoring and stalking by GPS are very common. And um, equally, when they talk to the um, workers and talk to the survivors, they say the most common um, TFA that experienced by um, domestic violence survivors um, are those ones that I talk about. So yeah, test uh, Facebook, go on Facebook, and then also um, the uh, use of uh, GPS tracking. Um, so, and they found, like when they do the research, they found 98%, nearly every, all the workers that they interview, they have come across that um, some of the clients have experienced some form of abuse that is being perpetrated by um, technology. And you, can, you could probably imagine like, in when I was going through my domestic violence, like at least when he's not home or when he's out, like I got my space, I got my safe zone, so to speak, although it's not safe at home. But when you think about that, we all have, most of us have smartphone, you know, it's very common, it's very convenient, it's very accessible, you know, quite effective too. That's why I suppose that's why perpetrator think about, well, why not use it to instill fear and control because it's 24 seven. So some um, researchers have come out to say the impact, the effect of um, this type of um, TFA is, is um, very close to psychological and emotional abuse, but it have a much longer lasting effect on victim survivors as well. Um, so yeah, it is quite uh, alarming. Like, uh, and, it, and of course, like, like all digital, the reason that I'm talking to you because we don't have the, the space and the temporal um, boundary anymore. So equally, like with the smartphone, and if you're being um, perpetrated by the use of technology, that apply as well. So um, come back to my um, own, um, research. So I'm not trying to demonize technology because for me, uh, technology is neutral. It is the person who use it that could be, um, you know, have a very, can become like, you know, that's the evil person who use the tools to exert, to um, achieve their, um, you know, the inequal, the coercive control, so to speak. Um, Okay, and that's why like, I, I showed here like some of the clips of the um, headlines from some of the local the news. So perpetrator using drones to stalk victim and, you know, and equally, um, you know, technology can be used to uh, track domestic um, uh, perpetrator, domestic violence perpetrator. And also in Australia, we also, um, particularly in Victoria that I speak of because we have my research base, um, they also organization uh, utilizing what they call technology-based um, response, like DAISY is an app. So um, women can download that and the app will actually, um, you can go on the app and then will tell you, you know, some information about uh, what domestic violence is, you know, because knowledge is important and uh, where to seek help. And um, there's also like, uh, they call a safety card um, that uh, women can use. And um, there's also like a push towards like a safe at home. So uh, rather than in the old, I think used to be like women will escape and then they go to the refuge or somewhere, the perpetrator stay at home and then they have this um, initiative for some years now, of course, they, uh, if it is safe for the women to stay in their own home, then they will remove the perpetrator. And um, sometimes they will need to install like surveillance camera around the house and, you know, they will have like, um, a uh, safety alarm that if they don't feel safe, they will press the alarm and then they will alert the authority. And um, because my research is uh, mainly focusing on the cohort is the ethnic Chinese women. So um, in terms of the Chinese community, so like what I have there is also like they are trying to um, focusing on um, how to live safely and um, some tips and workshop that has been rolled out as well. So. Um, pretty much my, um, what I'll try to find out is what is it like to experience domestic violence in the digital age and what can I do as an advocate? So that's why it got me into doing this research. And I want to talk a bit about my uh, approach of 
um, how I frame my research and how I analyze my data. Um, so I interview um, workers, uh, uh, domestic violence specialist um, petitioner, that lots of them are bicultural in that, that they speak the language um, as well as um, they're coming from the similar background of the survivors. And then in the stage two, I actually interview um, ethnic Chinese women. When I say ethnic Chinese, I have to clarify a bit because when they think Chinese, they, mostly people would think about, oh, they are from China. But um, it's very diverse itself when I say um, Chinese community because uh, we have, Australia is a very multicultural um, place. So uh, my, myself is from Hong Kong. So there will be other ethnic Chinese women from Taiwan, uh, could be from Macau, could be from Singapore, Malaysia. So it's all different, like how we identify ourselves. And, um, and I use, uh, besides like, um, so like grounding it in like the, the um, gender inequality, because it's a gender-based violence, I also utilize uh, the intersectionality um, feminist framework to um, approach my data because uh, I acknowledge that, that the gender um, inequality is the pillar, the one foundation of like what's causing violence against women, especially domestic violence, which is the most common form of um, violence against women. But as a migrant um, and as a um, women from a non-English speaking background, there are other factors in play that um, how, so like, you know, lots of research will say what we call here in Australia is cult women. So it's culture and linguistic diverse women. Um, they will say, yeah, co-women are more vulnerable to domestic violence, violence against women, but why? So that's also one of my research questions as well. So I hope that by using the intersectionality um, framework that I could look into other, like their social um, location, how it impact on their experience of their lived experience. Um, so, um, from what I, um, I've already done all my uh, interviews, so I'm doing the analysis and writing it up. So um, what I found from both workers as well as women is um, language barrier is number one issue here because lots of the migrants from non-English speaking background, in my case, is the um, Chinese community. Um, either their lack of confidence of their English or they just don't have the English ability. So that is the major um, issue here. And how do they then access services? You know, how do then they find out, um, you know, all these apps that's online, you know, and that brings in another factor is the digital um, ability and the digital um, affordability. So digital inclusion is also in it as an other, you know, more structural because we know that digital inclusion um, com comprise of say the access, the affordability, as well as the skills. So this is an other layer that will impact on women's um, experience as well. And the other um, finding that come of my research is the age because um, I interview women in their twenties. I also have women, couple of women, say in their seventies, and um, you know they have lived experience domestic violence. They are avid user of their smartphone, but you can tell that that because of the age difference and how long they've been using it, how they've been introduced to um, technology, there are inequality there as well. So um, for the younger group, they are able to do a lot more with their smartphone, but for the older age group. Um, it's pretty much limited to like just use the smartphone as a telephone and to communicate. But that said, um, technology is like the smartphone is that I found women are so like they love their smartphone, you know, they absolutely change some of the women's life. Um, like the women in their 70s, you know, one woman who have, who are restricted to, you know, in the old days, like calling IDD, you know, home and have no access. And, but since um, her husband passed away, she was able to get uh, get hold of a smartphone. And in the seven, in 
in, in her 70s, credit to her, she learned how to use it and she's on, you know, one of those instant messaging app, you know, with her friends and families every day, you know, she's able to break the isolation that was, I, su I suppose, one of the product of being in a situation of domestic violence because the aim is actually to isolate the women. And um, then another finding is the gender. And there's also a gender um, thing playing in here in the in sense of the technology, because even the workers and the women, lots of them are afraid of using technology because they think um, when it comes to technology, it's a male thing, like, oh, if uh, I can't figure it out, um, I'll get uh, a man, like a husband or something like that to help out. And like lots of the women before they left their um, situation, um, majority of them were telling me, oh, I'm in charge of, you know, look at the kids, you know, I'm in charge of finance, could be, but the technology side, oh, is his, um, you know, uh, strong point. So they are con in control in a sense of the technologies, like say, for example, setting up the modem, you know, setting up the laptop, setting up the smartphone, and you know the account so on and so forth so there's also implication in that as well um so yeah um i hope that that um i um ex give a bit of um, sense of explaining what my research is about but i like to um end in a more positive approach on empowering women um in terms of technology use i came across a tech talk by a Dutch activist at Yvonne, I think, and she talked about the power of citizen video to create undeniable truths. Um, of course, in my research, it's um, not so much about you know citizen video or something like that. But what what we want to bring home is. Um, she was talking about in India, women have already started to using, you know, Snapchat filters to protect the identity, you know, when speaking about domestic violence and, you know, things like, you know, they are being tortured at home, but never get them out. But the, um, having the device that can connect them to the outside world is really powerful. And yes, so fighting human rights abuse is really hard. There's no easy solution for human rights abuse, that's what she said, I'm quoting her. And there's no a single piece of technology that can ever stop the perpetrators. But for survivors, for the victims, for the marginalized communities, their stories, their truths matter. And that is where justice begins. So that's her word. So it's so powerful when I read it. I like Even now I got shivers from that because um, what I try to um, achieve through my research is um, give women the voice so that um, they can talk about their what's close to them and I also ask them like what do they think can help other women like them in the situation that utilize um, technology so watch this space so um, um, I'm still in the middle of it and um, yes so um, I'm gonna have about I go, go with time so um, yes so that's that's all from me um, yes, and thank you so much for um, this opportunity. And yes, thank you. Thank you so much. I I think listening to you, we I think I don't know about everyone else, but I could certainly re re relate to so much of what you said about it being in even more difficult for older women, and to you know to use technology to escape the isolation and to escape his abusive situations and particularly man you know technology being a man's domain and uh, we'd love to hear from more from you in you know we have a few questions and uh, i'd like to uh, ask a couple of questions to asunta first um, asunta uh, uh, one of the questions that our audience has asked is are doctors and medical staff mandated to report domestic violence and if not what are your thoughts and another one uh, was i'll just uh, give you both the questions what type of screening do you do at the hospital universal or case finding or some other form okay um so the first question so um no fa um, family and domestic violence is not a mandated report the only thing that's mandated in victoria is um child physical and sexual abuse um, and cumulative harm, so only children. Um, so no, it's not uh, mandated. 
Um, my view on it, it's, it's complicated because we, we need it to be an empowerment model for women. Um, so, you know, most sometimes women don't even know they're experiencing family and domestic violence. And, you know, uh, we, as social work, we do a lot of education. Um, also, you know, these women have taken, have been, they had their decision-making control taken away from them. And as um, practitioners and as um, people in a, a position of power, we don't want to exert power and control over this person again and tell them what we think they should do because she's the expert in her own safety and so she knows when the best time is to take action when the best time is to leave we know that when women leave they're at most risk of being murdered so you know it needs to be done in a really controlled way not in a way that puts women at risk again and you know the other thing is that who are we to go in and um, tell her that you know we know better? This the woman has been surviving in a way for a long time, and as we said, she is the expert. Um, so uh, you know I'm conflicted about whether we should or not, but I think that leaving it as an empowerment model puts the decision making control back into women's hands, and that's what we want. Um, but definitely for children, we are mandated. In a sense, the L17, which is the police initiated intervention order, in a way gives the um, police some power to remove the perpetrator in that, in that way. It's almost like, a, uh, you know, like it triggers a response that then um, the police can refer her to specialist services. Um, so in a way, it's sort of mandated the back way so anyway so that's that's my long answer about that i hope that answers that question and the other question is what screening tool so this, the tool is called the um uh, risk, risk screening tool um so it asks a series of um I, and i'm happy to put a, a link or send lauren or fatima a link that you can forward on to participants to all the screening tools because they're available public publicly screening and assessment tools um, and it asks um, questions about so there's a few few triggers so if clinical indicators are present then we will we will ask clinicians to screen because we don't do universal screening because the evidence suggests that universal screening is not effective but we do screen all women in antenatal settings because we know that pregnancy is a high risk time so um, in antenatal settings, there's a screening tool that we're trying to get midwives to use. They don't all use it, but we're trying to get them to use it and asks for questions like, you know, um, is someone in your family doing something that's making you feel scared? Are they controlling you? Are they threatening you? Are they physically hurting you? Do you have concerns about your children? So it's about four questions that then trigger a response. Um, so that, that's a validated tool and the, and the whole, the, the, the plan is that everybody will use the same tool so that when we're assessing risk, no matter what sector you're from, everybody is talking the same language. Thank you, Sunda. We have uh, another question for you and then another one for Shamima. The question, yep. uh, Sunda, for you is um, 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 what kind of uh, ads, you mentioned the TV ads that uh, triggered some perpetrators. Uh, could you elaborate yes. a little more about what those ads were? And then Shamima, following mm. that, uh, if you could uh, tell us about um, uh, what, are, what are some of the good stories from Fiji and the Pacific that feminist principles are incorporated into national policies have, you know, have actually worked and led to real change for women and girls. So the government set up an organization called Our Watch and they're a statutory body and they're um, primary prevention. So they did a series of ads and they basically show um, men disrespecting women, um, men, uh, women in vulnerable situations that they weren't, um, you know, they're not the, the, they didn't show physical assault, but they showed disrespectful behavior and other men calling it out. Um, there was also a lot of advertising of you deserve, you know, messages like you deserve to feel, to feel safe if you're suffering domestic violence, please call these hotlines. So, you know, initially when that started, the specialist services told us that um, there was a backlash. And there's a book by Jess Hill called mm -hmm. um, See What You Made Me Do. And she goes into uh, detail about the, you know, she goes into the response about that. Yes, actually, I've talked about some of the good stories about, you know, incorporation of uh, feminist perspectives into uh, 
uh, service delivery protocols, referral systems, and so on, and the, and the prevention, national prevention plan. Uh, but I think we can also talk about how the work of women, the advocacy and lobbying has also, um, you know, uh, given rise to good legislation around the Pacific on family violence, though, be it that it's uh, gender neutral, uh, that is where they didn't listen to the women. So there is a lot of counter, uh, you know, uh, reporting from men uh, about women uh, and so on. But good legislations and, uh, you know, um, governments coming on board, also, you know, men wanting to be part of the solution of ending violence against women. Uh, we did not uh, expect uh, things like uh, men wanting to do this work on male advocacy. And, uh, but we are finding, and particularly traditional leaders, uh, they are recognizing the high rates of uh, 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 sexual assaults and rapes and so on uh, in the remote areas, rural areas and so on. So, you know, people who are coming on board, the religious who have stayed away from it all as much as possible, and they have their own programs going and using, you know, the Bible, because Christianity is the most prevalent religion in the Pacific. So, you know, using that, using the scriptures and so on to, to work on ending violence against women and actually addressing within the, within the churches. So I think these are some of the good stories. Um, you know, still, we still have, like last year, we had 10 deaths. We have a population of about 800,000 in this country and 10 deaths of women at the hands of men and their partners is, is quite high for us. But I believe that uh, changes are incremental. And as I said before, we just have to celebrate those little gains that we make. Thank you, Shamima. Um, I have a couple more questions. Um, uh, one is for Yi. Uh, Yi, we loved hearing about your work and uh, do you, we'd love to read about it as well. So do you, will you be publishing it, uh, publishing it soon? And another question is for the, for any of the presenters who ever would like to answer it about the inclusion of trans women and how, uh, how you're working to uh, address GBV against trans women. Okay. Um, thank you. Yeah, um, the publication, I got a book chapter coming out and um, I intended to, because I um, very much want to um, bring back all the findings, um, because I'm not the expert, I'm only, you know, channeling all the participants' um, idea and their wisdom. So I intend to publish a um, couple other journal articles too, so I can keep you posted on that line. And uh, I might jump in to answer about the trans women. Um, I, my own research um, didn't touch on that um, because um, I'm focusing on a different area, but I, I know that other researchers in um, Melbourne, they are um, also are very inclusive. They actually, there's a um, research project that talk about and actually have been released, if you're interested, I can give you the link later, is about uh, the safe use of dating apps and um, the, uh, in the um, LBGT um, plus um, uh, that's their cohort and they found like how this group of people utilize um, the technology as well as uh, where they benefit of them and also in terms of like um, sexual health and so on and so forth. Yeah, so that's my bit. I let other um, speakers to talk about um, in terms of um, transgender person in the um, GBV work, yes. Hmm. Our programs are all inclusive of LGBT uh, community, Q community, and uh, you know, this is an emerging issue in, uh, in the Pacific and there's a lot of backlash, uh, but uh, the programs that we have in Fiji and around the network is inclusive of trans women. They have their own organizations uh, that they work with and they're trying to set up their own counseling services and so on. But uh, over the years, uh, we have been able to support uh, those who have, uh, we've been very inclusive in our support for them. Thank you, um, Shamima. Actually, we have another question for you, um, uh, Asunta. And um, that question was, do you feel that the uh, benefits outweigh the, the negative side of the um, advertising? And um, how can we raise awareness and do primary prevention in the media without triggering backlash? Perpetrators often believe that women are under their, under their control anyway, and, and that you know nobody would pay attention to those, and why, why would they? 
Um, but I think that, you know, we have to talk about it because the, pro the issue it previously was that it was silent and that was even worse for women. So I, I think that, you know, um, that it does need to be spoken out. It does need to be put in mainstream media because it's the only way we're going to fight those attitudes. If we, if we don't talk about it, we face women um, being silenced again and trapped in their homes and not being able to access services and not knowing about services. So I think, yeah, definitely it does outweigh some of the bad things. Thank you. We have another question uh, for Shamima. How do you encourage reporting, especially partnering with men? Uh, GVV is obviously highly underreported in communities which are highly patriarchal. And it seems that the reporting encourages communities um, like local and religious leaders to come on board in addressing GVV. Over the years, we've had an increase in reporting, particularly of domestic violence and rape of women and of children. And uh, this is because of all the work in the community that is being done uh, by us, by the police, by the Ministry for Women and other organizations, the awareness is quite, uh, uh, quite uh, high. And uh, you know, we've also got uh, the government is contracting uh, the toll-free lines to organizations like the Fiji Women's Crisis Center, and another one is a child helpline to another organization, and so on. So, uh, you know, so people are getting to know these numbers and they are calling in and so on. Now, in a very patriarchal situation, what we've done is we've brought in uh, the traditional leaders, and the we've got a traditional structure called the Itoke Affairs Board or Ministry for Itoke Affairs and so on. So, uh, you know, the provincial councils and so on, where all these, uh, the, the officers are running the provincial um, work and so on. So we've tried to bring them in and that is showing a lot of traction and making, you know, like sort of, and creating male advocacy within the villages, but they have to work with the women's groups that are there. And so we are finding that retired police officers we are using, the traditional leaders we are using, the youth leaders we are using, both men and women, who are coming together and because the men hold so much power we, we you know they they actually are leading this charge on reporting on talking to the younger men and uh, actually taking uh, uh, the, the the survivor uh, down to a place uh, to a counseling service or to the hospital to the health center or the police station so you know we had during the covid lockdown we had one traditional leader actually from the mountains trying to contact us and, uh, and bringing down a survivor, a young survivor and her mother because uh, the police station up in the hills would not listen, so brought them down and then, you know, we continued with whatever we needed to do. So, you know, some, so those are some of the good stories and that's how we use. It's, you know, a work, you know, as I said to you, it's hard, but it's getting quite a bit of traction. So uh, that's the way we work with the religious leaders, you know, we started working with them on the male advocacy, doing awareness with them. The Anglican Church has really come out leading this charge um, amongst the churches, and they've got good programs, guidance counseling, and getting training from uh, feminist organizations. And we've got some good male advocates uh, within, the, uh, within the Christian churches. So, yeah, so that's how we are uh, proceeding with that. Thank you, Shamima. So I'd like to ask one question for all three presenters. Um, and so the question is, how, what do you think is the one main challenge in asserting a feminist perspective and uh, addressing GBV? And how do you uh, plan to address it? I just said patriarchy, that's the main challenge. And, the, <laughs> and, and you know, the patriarchal structures, what it brings and coupled with the traditional structures. So, you know, that would be the main challenge. And, you know, you have to really chip away at it. Uh, and, uh, you know, the way we do it is we try to get everywhere, never say no to a request, use the media, get in there and keep talking. We've been talking about the same thing for 36 years. You know, and people say, oh, you've been talking about the same thing, but look, look the changes have come about. And now they're saying, you're talking about the same things, and now we are realizing what you were talking about. So I think, you know, that's how we do it, getting to the women first, women first. We never lose the agency of women in this work. And then, you know, getting to the men, to the boys, getting in through sports and so on. Yeah, so, and that's how you break it down. But women also, you know, need, uh, we, we work with them to realize just what patriarchy does and so on. So... 
Yes, and you know, we have very basic uh, um, learning tools and using it within the cultural context. Uh, and and uh, that's how we can do it. So people are not scared of the word patriarchy. People are, uh, you know, more open to sharing privileges and, uh, and uh, things like that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's a big, a big question. Um, but I agree. I think unless we address gender inequality, unless we address patriarchal systems and systems of ma that are dominated by men, decision-making systems that are dominated by men, um, you know, um, unless we address those issues, then we will never get um, violence against women um, under control or eliminated. And um, I think that, you know, we've got a responsibility for the next generation. We need to raise powerful, strong feminists um, and teach girls early that it's okay to stand up for yourself. It's okay to, um, to you know, to not not and notice those signs you know we're, we're bombarded by messages from the media that you know that it's romantic when a boy checks your phone that it's romantic when a when a boy or you know anyone really doesn't have to be a boy when someone you know tries and um and finds out what you're doing where you're going tells you how to dress um and those things are really important that we teach girls that it's not okay for someone to tell you what to do so i think we have responsibility to raise strong powerful feminists and also um, feminist boys. We need to have boys who become feminists and understand that, you know, that, um, that it's about respectful relationships and that we, and men need to give up some of their power. Yes, I absolutely agree with um, all has been said about uh, the gender inequality and the patriarchal. For me, the main challenge I've seen in, the, um, in my community is um, there's still so much stigma and so much uh, myth that attached to um, domestic violence and violence against women. And um, in a way, in the, in the bigger sense as well, and even in Australia, I was quite um, taken by it because I thought as a Western culture, Western society, I would think that there's more gender equal, but it's not the case. And, and um, it's quite shocked me in a way that, um, that gender inequality and the pig is so deep seated in in us, in even sometimes we, my myself, um, are product of it because we have been um, somehow that we got the idea. Say, even give you a quick example. It's like even a simple task of going to buy a birthday card, and you you will then drawn to girl, okay, pink, boy, blue. That is so deep seated in our psyche that it's so hard to unpack it. So there's a lot more work to be done to like what, you know, raise strong feminist, you know, next generation, not just, um, I absolutely agree, not just the, the, the girl, but also the boys, because I've got a boy and a, a girl myself. So try to break that stereotyping of the gender role as well. And what's happening at the home, you know, who, who should be doing the dishes, who should be doing, you know, put, putting in the work. So um, that would be a major challenge for me is to, to break the silence, to break that norm that we have known for so long and to actually have some real equality between the two gender and to try to then come from the little things and try to then radiate it to um, solve this age old issue of domestic violence. Yes. Hmm. Thank you, Yi. Um, all, all three answers really resonated with me. And, you know, as a, as a young girl growing up in South Asia, I remember what you said about breaking the cycle and raising feminist boys as well is so important because when I look at the men around me who, who were boys, young boys in the 90s, I see so much of the really damaging sort of movies and you know other content that we saw, popular media content in the 90s. It, it is so visible in some of their behavioral patterns uh, uh, in the, and in their interaction with women. And you know, we, we have to break the cycle and being, you know, working with uh, raising feminist boys is a very important part of that. Um, 
Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. You can learn more about GoFem's work and uh, about feminist approaches in particular on this slide there. Um, there's, you can go to our website called gofemsocialchange.org. And please, if you're interested in learning more about our work or joining GoFem and becoming a member, you know, we are increasingly looking to reach out to activists in um, uh, Asia Pacific, and we would love to have more uh, members from the region. So please do get in touch with us with any on any of these um, uh, social media handles, and you can also email us. And um, please do, we will be sending you um, a post-webinar uh, evaluation survey. So please do share your thoughts. And, you know, we'd, we'd love to hear more from you and we hope to stay in touch and, you know, have more interesting and vibrant discussions with everyone. Thank you for joining us.